Well, welcome, um, everybody. My name is Greg Orwig. I serve as the Vice President for Admissions and Financial Aid at Whitworth, and I'm joined tonight by our superstar Assistant VP for Student Financial Services, Tracy Stensland, who is going to be doing most of the presentation, and she has worked in financial aid um, at Whitworth for over 30 years, and she will have answers to all of your questions, I'm sure. Um, as you're joining in tonight, we'd love to have you um, jump into the chat function and just uh, enter, tell us where you're from, you know, introduce yourself and where you're from. It's always exciting to see how um, kind of widespread our participants are. So um, let me just pull that up so I can see who we've got tonight. Um, we plan to present for probably about three quarters of the time, and then we'll definitely try to leave time for questions from you all that we encourage you to type into the Q&A um, tool within Zoom. Um, I'm not seeing, Tracy, are you seeing anybody in the chat introducing themselves? I don't. Yeah, me neither. So if, if you've joined the webinar, um, Please just kind of type your name and um, where oh, you're see, from. I see Holly. I see Andrea. I just. Oh, it says chat is disabled. All right. Well, so we've got welcome Campbell family. OK, so they're using the Q&A. That's great. You can just use that. Um, Barbara, I don't know if you from where you are can see why the chat would be disabled I'll, I'll check up on that heidi holly isaac i just don't know where you all are from but welcome jana jason sounds like the naughty or nice list doesn't it Lori, maddie <laughs> laura maya mindy olivia paul samantha man you guys a lot um, of you Lori a from spokane i know a Lori a from spokane boise welcome all the way from Mead, welcome. Ooh. All right. Well, we're expecting a few more people. So, um, but I'll just take care of some preliminary um, things. I'm going to share my screen um, and open up the presentation. I hope everyone can see that. Tracy, is that coming through clearly for you? I can see it. Okay, good. So um, again, we're gonna cover uh, tips for filing the FAFSA, avoiding some common mistakes, how to um, put yourself in a position to qualify for as much financial aid as possible available from Whitworth as well as from state and federal resources. And, um, and then some specific information just as it relates to Whitworth. Um, if you do have specific questions, um, two options. One is type them in to the Q&A and um, we will either answer them kind of offline directly to you or I will um, feed them to Tracy to answer on the webinar for others to hear if it's something that we think um, might benefit other members on the, on the webinar tonight. Or, and I'll repeat this at the end, you can uh, contact our financial aid office uh, directly at finaid.whitworth.edu or at 509-777-3215 and someone in the financial aid office, um, especially if you have a pretty specific particular question to your situation, that would be the best way to get that answer. All right. Um, and then um, we'll get started it on our presentation. And I'll just, uh, again, introduce Tracy Stensline as our Assistant VP for Student Financial Services. Um, not only is she an expert on financial aid, but I don't know anyone who cares more deeply for students and wanting to support and help uh, students and families succeed in achieving their educational goals than Tracy. So we're so fortunate to have her presenting tonight. Tracy, take it away. Thanks, Greg. Um, I'm delighted to be with you this evening and share a little bit about the FAFSA um, and why it's really important to file it and the options it gives you. 
I want to share a little bit about what the difference is between need versus non-need based aid so that you understand when you get your financial aid offers a little bit more about maybe why you received what you received. We're going to talk about what happens before you file the FAFSA and what happens after you file the FAFSA. When I'm done talking about the FAFSA, Greg's going to jump on and share uh, with you about all our wonderful Whitworth scholarships and how to look for private scholarships. So the first thing I want to emphasize, oh, the first thing I'll share is that part of this presentation is provided by the National Association of Student Financial Aid Administrators. The, they're the national association that um, our team are, uh, belongs to. Uh, we receive our training through them to help us stay in compliance and administering federal aid. They also provide great training tools for us. So, so the slides that I'll be using related to the FAFSA are all uh, generated and provided by them. So why file the FAFSA? Um, well, it increases your opportunities to receive financial aid. And when I say that, I mean across the board. Um, some families have in their minds that they're not going to qualify for aid through the federal government. And so why file the FAFSA? But the FAFSA is used in a variety from a variety of entities to determine eligibility sometimes for financial aid and for scholarships. So it's really important just to get it done so that you you can you don't miss an opportunity. Sometimes outside, outside scholarships will require it. And then once you have it filed, you have it ready to go. Um, it's a free process. It doesn't cost anything for you to do it. It's easy, and when I say it's easy, I mean that it's it's fairly logical, and it's an online process um, with with skip logic in there. So if you put something in there, it doesn't make sense. It's going to let you know. Um, it's private. Uh, only the information is sent to the schools that you designate yourself, and all of that is stored in a safe way on college campuses. And sometimes things will change with families. Families think, well, I won't need student loans or I, I'm not gonna qualify for financial aid. And then part through partway through the school year, something changes and then they haven't filed the FAFSA and maybe missed some application deadlines, some resources, um, or if something has changed at stressful time, the family has it on file and they can pursue loans quickly um, rather than having to start with the FAFSA. We're beginning to see a little bit of a decrease across the US and families filing, and we're not really sure why that's happening. Um, but if you have any concerns about filing the FAFSA, or you need help with it, or there's a piece of it that makes you anxious, just give us a call and we'll talk you through it. I've been in financial aid for 35 years, and I know it's the best way for families to access resources for higher education. And so it's making me nervous as a financial aid administrator that families are moving away from it possibly. So we wanna like walk alongside you, hold your hand. We'll be with you through this FAFSA process. It, I, I guarantee you it's not as painful as it sounds. Um, and, it, and it will open doors for your student. Okay, the first thing is I wanna explain some terminology. So when we start talking about financial aid, you know how things are calculated. Every institution you're, the student applies to will have a uh, cost of attendance related to his or her um, cost for attending that, that specific school. And the government tells us what we can include in a cost of attendance. And sometimes you'll hear it referred to as a COA. Um, financial aid loves acronyms. We could spend a whole night just talking in letters and know exactly what we're talking about. Um, but sometimes you all don't know the acronym. So raise your hands if we use an acronym you don't know. But cost of attendance is comprised of tuition, fees, room or housing, and meals. It also takes into account a, a transportation costs, books and supplies, personal expenses, and if you're taking out student loans to us, the small amount in student loan fees. Okay, that is a cross board for every institution. Whoop, nope, not yet, Greg. Um, <laughs> across the board for every institution. Um, then you have your expected family contribution. And that's referred to as an EFC. And that is derived from you filling out the free application for federal student aid. And you can send that information to up to 10 schools. Um, the cost of attendance is going to vary from school to school. Your expected family contribution is going to be the same no matter where you go to school, but your financial need is going to change. And this is where I like to point out that if you're going to, maybe you're considering a lower cost institution, 
the cost is, is you know, $10,000 and your expected family contribution is 12. Are you gonna show financial need? No, but if you are going to a higher cost institution, maybe the cost of attendance is 65,000 and your family contribution is 12, are you gonna show financial need? You're gonna show a lot of financial need. So um, that's where when families say, I'm not gonna show eligibility for need-based aid, this formula will tell you whether or not you show not need at that respective school based on the cost of attendance minus the expected family contribution from the FAFSA. So there is aid that's based on need and there's aid that's not based on need that has nothing to do with it. So when a student receives a financial aid offer, most grants and federal and state programs but even Whitworth and institutions have need-based aid, aid that we're going to award based on how much the student shows in financial need based on that calculation. But then there's non-need-based aid. So if you're applying to Whitworth University, you um, will, if you're admitted, you will receive one of our university scholarships. Um, and that is not based on financial need. Um, and the FAFSA is not part of it, but we want to encourage families to be considered for both need-based and non-need-based um, at all times so that you get as much resources as possible. So um, those are kind of the two buckets and you don't wanna miss out on either, either bucket. Okay, the different types of financial aid. Um, the best financial aid would be the free, free, free aid, the gift aid, the scholarships and grants. And that's where you don't have to do anything to receive them like work or borrow on the other side, which is self-help aid. Scholarships are typically based on merit, um, on academics, um, on some sort of talent, um, where grants are typically based on financial need. Um, and so that's the right side of the wheel is usually where families like the most financial aid. But when you receive your financial aid offers from the various institutions, you will receive aid from the gift aid and from the self-help. Now the loans, when you see the loans, keep in mind, these are federally insured student loans. They're loans for students. The fees are like 1%. The students have six months from the time the student graduates to begin repayment. The interest rates are maintained um, based on the T-bills. They try to keep them fairly low. Um, so they're not your typical consumer loans. The federal government also has ceilings based uh, uh, for each grade level. So students can't over borrow. There's very actually, I would like to see the limits on these loans go up because they're an excellent way for students to build credit. They give them flexibility after graduating. If they go on to grad school, they can defer on the loan that's being subsidized by the government, the subsidized loan. Um, if you pay that off within the six month grace period, it's an interest free loan. So it's not a consumer loan. It's an excellent way to help with defray higher education expenses. And then of course we have our student employment program, our work study program. We have a very robust program at Whitworth. We have a lot of student employees. We have three in our office. They're awesome. They're getting great experience. And now with, um, the minimum wage being what it is, you know, students work 10 hours a week, eight to 10 hours a week, and they're earning about $4,000 to $4,500 a year. So that's a good way to help out with books and supplies, personal expenses, and some of those indirect costs. Students are typically paid directly. Um, and so it helps, it helps them budget throughout the semester. And statistically, we know students retain and do better in school who are in a work on campus work program. They're more engaged in their campus activities. They have people watching out for them. Um, I know that when our students come in, they say they have midterms or a paper, that is their first priority. Unlike maybe working at an, on an off-campus job, which isn't as flexible. So we, we really encourage and support our work study program. Um, part of that program is subsidized by our federal and state governments. Uh, so it could be based on financial need, but at Whitworth, we also have just regular student employment. Um, so we encourage all students, whether they show financial need for a need-based program or not, to, to be working on campus. Okay, this slide just uh, is an overview of where that gift aid and that self-help aid, self aid comes from. 
The federal government is the largest source of financial aid for students. It provides the federal Pell Grant, it provides the federal direct loans, uh, supplemental educational opportunity grants. Um, so it has very robust programs for, for families. Our state of Washington does an amazing job um, of providing a state knee grant program that at Whitworth is close to 9,800. Um, and then also the college bound program. If you signed up for that in, in middle school here in the state of Washington, between those two programs, you're looking at like close to $12,000. Um, so excellent federal and state resources there. Again, you need to file the FAFSA. Colleges and universities come to the table. Uh, we, we have a very robust uh, student, I mean, financial aid programs. We contribute a lot of scholarship dollars to our students. Um, but we also have a need-based grant program. So not only can the student qualify for a university scholarship, a housing grant, a visit scholarship, but by filing the FAFSA can be considered for a need-based uh, university grant. Um, oh, not done yet. There's private sources. Uh, you wanna be checking with your high school counselor and researching all outside sources, like outside scholarships um, to see, and that those will become really popular in the spring. So Christmas break is a great time to start getting your resume together. And Greg will be talking about that a little bit more, but private outside scholarships. And then employers, um, I encourage families to check with their employers to see if they have any employee scholarship programs for dependents um, or uh, employer pay programs that will help cover tuition. Okay, just a little bit on the FAFSA form here. It does collect some demographic and financial information. The information is used to calculate the expected family contribution. And the main components of that, um, as you probably know, would be the adjusted gross income of the family, taxes paid, the number in the household. Uh, right now, this year will be the number in college, um, where the family lives, the age of the older parent, because there's an asset protection, um, and then the assets of the family. So it takes into account multiple uh, pieces of information from that family to come up with the expected family contribution. And we know that's not necessarily what you're gonna owe or what you're gonna pay. It's simply a way for um, us to administer federal, federal aid or need-based aid in an equitable way. Um, so most colleges use the EFC to administer their financial aid programs. Some will elect to have their own formulas for their own aid. Whitworth doesn't do that. We're staying with the federal methodology as we just find it's more equitable and consistent for families. The FAFSA is available in English and Spanish. The, as you, I hope you've heard by now, but the FAFSA opened October 1st. Um, so it's online to be completed. Um, so you can begin filling it out anytime now, or hopefully some of you have already done it. Some colleges will have priority deadlines. So be really careful that you are completing the FAFSA to meet your first priority deadline. Um, some schools have deadlines related to institutional funding or other programming. And so they will set deadlines uh, that the student has to meet in order to qualify for those programs. Uh, we don't have that but we do like you to apply as early as possible so that we can get you an early financial aid offer in January that gives you enough time to get through all the steps and understanding the processes and being ready uh, for the May 1st deadline. If you don't qualify to complete the FAFSA, um, the state does have a document called the WASFA that undocumented individuals can complete. So if you fall into that category you, and you need a little bit of guidance, please feel free to give us a call. Um, but it, it mirrors the FAFSA, so it's gonna ask similar questions, if not almost the same questions. Um, and that allows us to get an EFC for those families who can't complete the FAFSA. 
Okay, so as you know, when you use the web, it's really easy to land on websites that look like where you're supposed to be, but you're not really there. So I always do a screenshot of where you're supposed to be um, when you apply for, for federal aid. You should be at the federal student aid website. It's studentaid.gov. You should, it should look like this. Um, you would be, uh, if you're a new student, um, then you're gonna be starting the new FAFSA process. Uh, if you happen to be a transfer student on this call, then maybe you're a returning user, you're gonna be doing a reapplication for the FAFSA. So, um, but this is what the screen should look like when you start. Um, you shouldn't complete, you shouldn't pay any fees uh, related to this form. Now, there were some sites out there that tried to model the federal site and then ask for a fee or ask for, you know, if you pay this, we'll help you with it. You shouldn't need to pay to apply for aid, it's free. If, if you come across something like that, clear your browser and call us and we'll make sure you land on the right site. Okay, so then the parent or the student can start the process. You can certainly use a preparer. The preparer will have to sign off on the FAFSA that he or she were part of the process. You shouldn't need a preparer. You shouldn't pay for that service because you are in a town. Uh, well, you're, most, most towns have multiple colleges or at least one college you should be able to access maybe and get some help. If not, call us, we'll do a Zoom call for you. So we can help you with it. You shouldn't have to pay or prepare, but this is the launch page that'll tell you whether you're, you're the parent or the student, uh, but you do have to identify wh who's starting the process. Okay, so this is the one process I will tell you can be a little frustrating. Um, it's just a little sensitive. Um, but once you get through it, all is good and you're going to protect your FSA ID. It's an electronic signature for all your federal processes. Uh, both student and parent need to access one. Um, parent, if you're the one, you're, it's going to be the parent who completes the FAFSA with the, fan, with the student. Um, so make sure you hang on to your FSA ID in case you decide to pursue a federal parent loan because it's going to be the same ID number. Um, and used for all federal forms. So, but both student parents should start here, get this, and then go into the FAFSA and start it. Because when you can hold your FAFSA, you can start it and hold it um, and go back in once you have your FSA ID. But I think it's personally smoother to get your FSA ID, then go into it and finish it until the end and sign off on it. They do, the federal government does provide on studentaid.gov a FAFSA worksheet. And some families really like this because what you do with these worksheets is you complete them um, as if you were completing like a paper FAFSA. It's just gonna prompt you to fill in the numbers so that when you actually sit down and do the online form, you're basically doing data entry um, and you're not like stuck at a point and have to come back to it. So um, it's, it's very, very helpful. Um, in the FAFSA uh, itself, it is using going to use a 2021 uh, tax information, and it is going to give you the option to download that information through a data retrieval process. So even though it would be helpful for you to have a copy of your tax return uh, when you complete your worksheet and the FAFSA, you will have the option of doing that. Okay, here's some places where families can make some errors. Social security numbers. I swear I knew my social security number. I swear I did, I swear I did. And the student's off by one number. So we always tell families, go get your social security cards. Make sure you have your numbers accurate. Students in particular, the number is your key at the institutions. So you complete your FAFSA and then you've completed your admissions application and they're not the two, so the social security numbers are not the same we can't match it up. And so um, that's why it's really important that those numbers match. Um, divorce, widowed, and remarried. Um, that can get tricky, especially with where the student lived, which parent to put on the FAFSA. There are really clear directions, so make sure you review those. And if you have any questions, consult with a financial aid counselor. Um, income earned by parent or step-parent. Um, once you determine the parent that's gonna complete the FAFSA, if that parent has remarried um, or the student has a step parent, 
The step parents information is required on the FAFSA. Um, and um, I know um, I've had multiple families say our, our, our um, finances are separate. Um, I'm paying for my kids, he's paying for his kids. Uh, but the federal government doesn't work that way on the FAFSA. It's one family, all resources in that household have to be reported for all students. Untaxed income that you may have had that um, related to pensions. Um, US income tax is paid, make sure it's the, pay, the paid amount and not the uh, withheld amount, sometimes gets confused. Household size. Um, the household size can be tricky because what they're asking for you on the FAFSA is the household size that will be when the student is in school, in college. So that's from July 1st, 2023 to June 30th, 2024. How many are going to be in the household in that 12 month period? And that could be different than what's happening now. The same holds true for what number of the household is in college. Real estate investments, sometimes we see that families report their primary residence, their home equity. Uh, you do not have to report your primary residence or your home equity on your FAFSA. The government took that out a while back. Also make sure that if you are reporting any investments that you, you report the net worth. Um, so you're subtracting any debt that's on that real estate. Once you've completed the free application for federal student aid, you're gonna send it off to what we call the central processing system. Um, that's a contractor through the Department of Education who is gonna take that data and securely run it through the federal methodology to come up with the EFCs and send them to the colleges that you have listed. You can list 10 on your initial application. You can go back, you can take schools off and add other ones if you want to. You, the student, will receive an email that has a student aid report in it. Um, and I'll show you a screenshot of that. It will be sent to the email that you've reported that you listed on the FAFSA. So make sure that you're checking your email address that you're using for your higher education communications. So here, is an example of an email notification that you will get um, and it provides you information um, about your FAFSA. It's what they call an electronic student aid report. And really what it is, is just an overview of what you reported to them. It's like a receipt. This is, we've received your FAFSA. This is the data we received. This is your family contribution. Um, and so it's good to take a few minutes and review that. Um, to make sure that everything looks accurate um, on your student aid report. If your email is invalid, if you go to the next slide, Greg, you will get a document that looks like this. It's simply a student aid rep report in paper form, and it tells you the same information. Now, part of what the student aid report is going to disclose for you is um, whether or not you qualified for their federal grant program, the Pell Grant program. It'll also tell you if you qualified for a student loan, but that's not an incomplete financial aid offer. That's just those two federal programs, and it may not even be accurate. Um, the schools are gonna review this. If they have any questions or concerns, they're gonna follow up with you. Um, and then we'll talk about special circumstances in a minute, but don't, don't go, oh, I didn't qualify for the Pell Grant, so I'm not receiving any financial aid. That's one federal program over out of a lot of different options for you. If you found that when you review your student aid report that you've made an error, it's fine. You can go back and make a correction. You will need your FSA ID and your parent will need to sign off on it as well. And you make the correction, put your FSA IDs in there and submit. And then again, the schools that are listed will receive the correction. So you wanna just re review your schools, make sure that all the schools are listed are the ones you want to receive the corrections. Now we know as financial aid administration and so, so does the Department of Education that the FAFSA doesn't collect uh, special circumstances. It is a snapshot of the family's resources at the time of signature. Um, so I always tell families, you know, 
don't complete the FAFSA on the day you get paid. Pay your bills, give them an, you know, a realistic representation of your cash, checking and savings, not an inflated. Um, but we know that there are other expenses that your family is enduring that is that will reduce your eligible, your reduce your uh, income for higher education. Um, so we, the Department of Ed doesn't want to know those. They rely on us to um, talk to you about your situation. And then we collect the necessary documentation and signatures to make those corrections and adjustments for you. Um, and let me just show an example of some of the special circumstances I'm talking about. Greg, next slide. Okay. So sometimes families will have medical or dental expenses that are, would not be covered in insurance. Um, maybe you've lost a parent or a spouse, or you have, um, you've lost an income. Uh, you have children that you have a lot of daycare expenses for. Uh, there's been a divorce in the family um, and that's been expenses. We also are seeing um, more and more families take in um, older family members, aunts and uncles and parents. And there's an expense to that. Some families are paying for secondary school tuition um, and we're a private school, so we support that. So that's an expense. So we can take into account special circumstances um, and adjust your FAFSA under federal regulations with uh, proper signatures. And that sometimes can make the student uh, eligible for additional financial aid. Um, one example is, you know, they, they go two years back on your income um, and you're like, well, I had a great year in 2022, but now I've lost my job or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we can take into account the loss of income. Um, and that might make a difference in your family's resources for higher education, of course. And so the financial aid offer should be consistent with that. Um, the only thing that we can't do is adjust income for the year that the student is starting until mid-year, until we know what the family's income is going to look like. That's a little bit of a weed, but we can explain that to you um, if you fall into that situation. So before we move on to scholarships and researching um, private scholarships, I just wanted to see if we had any FAFSA questions. Yes, we do. Um, one is, when do student loans start to accrue interest? Oh, that's a good question. Okay, it's a two-part question. Um, this, the government has two, has two parts to their federal loan programs. They have a subsidized loan that's based on financial need and an unsubsidized that if the student doesn't show financial need can still access that great program. Um, so on the subsidized portion of, this, of the federal loan, the government's paying the interest on the student loan. And for six months after the student graduates or leaves school, on the unsubsidized, the student is responsible for uh, interest while the student's in school. Um, it begins accruing 30 days after dis first disbursement. The student can opt to pay it or ask that it goes on top of the principal and it can be paid six months after the student is no longer in school. It'll just be tacked on to the principal. It will not amortize. I mean, it will not snowball uh, and um, compound on top of interest. There's no compound interest on it. So, and repayment begins six months after. Six it's months, not all right. due six months after. And there are lots. Of, can you explain the different repayment options? Available. There's, yeah, there's six. Right now, there's six different repayment options. Um, there's the standard, which is the most aggressive. There's an extended. There is an income sensitive. There's a couple different income sensitive repayment options. Um, there's consolidation where you bring all your loans together. Um, so there's a, there a variety of different repayment options. And the nice thing about it is that you can choose one repayment option. So let's say you get out of school and you're gonna take an entry level position and you, you just want your student loans to be minimum, your payments minimal because you're just getting started. You can choose an income sensitive one um, or a graduated uh, version of the payment plan and then switch to the standard once you get your big promotion. You know, all Whitworth grads get promoted, right? So, you know, <laughs> we're gonna just, uh, you know, you can pay more when you're making more. And so, and there's no penalty for changing payment plans. 
And aren't there some loan forgiveness? Uh, there are related. There are related to public service. Mm -hmm. All right, a few more just came in. Do IRA and 401k assets show up in the EFC? Good question. The amount that you contribute for that tax year should be reported on the FAFSA, but your total amount of IRAs are not reported on the FAFSA. So your total IRA or retirement funds are not reported, just the not. amount you contributed for the year. So it shows up in your income. Uh, but not in your, not as an asset. Okay. Um, do assets held in irrevocable trusts count towards the EFC? That can't be revoked. So, so assets that have been permanently put in a trust, presumably for the benefit oh. of someone else. Obviously, if the trust is in the benefit of the student going to college, that might be different. But assuming here that it's for a trust. You yeah, know, all, yes, even trusts need to be reported, even if, if if you are the trustee of the trust, even if it's not intended or able to be accessed. Now, that might be a special circumstance. I've ha I have done adjustments for trust funds where uh, the trust fund was first, it was in the parent's name, it was an asset, it had to be reported, but clearly it was not going to be a resource for the student for higher education. Right. Okay, do you have to apply for FAFSA every year? And if I have two kids going to school, do they both apply? Um, yes and yes. One FAFSA for each student and then you'll reapply each year. Yes, okay. And do 529 or covered L education savings, you know, things that are college savings funds, do those uh, get factored into the EFC? They're part of your assets. If it's owned by the parents, it's gonna be the parent asset. So it needs to be reported accordingly, even if it's not for the student. So even if it's for a sibling. Um, okay. Um, I think you've answered some of these that we received ahead of time, but um, so one question came in in advance of the webinar tonight about how can you see, how can students and families see whether the FAFSA has been received by Whitworth? Mm -hmm. And the way you do that is to go to your um, app status page and you should have received, once you um, have applied, you get instructions about how to access your app status page and that shows um, lots of information, including different processes or steps that a student has completed or documents that we've received as well as those we haven't received. So if we have received your FAFSA, it'll show up in your status page with a green checkbox showing received. Um, when should a student start to apply for federal loans? Tracy. So in the spring, the student can, when the student knows which school he or she wants to attend, um, then uh, you can complete your master promissory note entrance loan counseling with your FSA ID at studentaid.gov and then you designate that school that you're attending. So the springtime, some of our students do it over the summer, um, but schools prefer if you do it in late spring once you decide which school you're attending. And is there a finite amount of student loan or federal aid resources available and kind of available on a first come first serve basis or it might run out? No, not under the federal loan program or Pell Grant. And you explained the difference, I think, between subsidized and unsubsidized loans, but maybe that bears repeating. Okay, so the subsidized is being subsidized by the federal government. They're paying the interest on the loan while the student is in school and for six months after. An unsubsidized loan, the government is not paying the interest. The student is responsible for the interest it'll begin accumulating within 30 days after the first disbursement. Um, and the student is responsible for the interest while in school can um, have it uh, added to the principal um, and then pay it when they go into repayment six months after graduation. Thank you. Um, so new question here. Um, this family has submitted a FAFSA for their older son who will be completing his senior year in 23-24. We had already submitted the FAFSA for our son who is very interested in Whitworth. 
Do we need to notify FAFSA or Whitworth of this? I'm a little um, clear. Um, if we're talking about two sons, one an older son who's senior year of college in 23, 24, and then another son who's interested in Whitworth. So I don't know um, if the person who, who submitted that question could maybe send in another question that we can um, be sure we're answering your question. The, the last point in this question is, will our EFC change the FAFSA allowance? So I think if there are two kids in college, it will definitely affect your EFC. It'll affect it this year, um, but you have a senior, so that's fine. They're changing, it, you will hear eventually in the media, they're gonna be changing the formula, uh, the methodology um, and, not use, and not factoring number in college, but this year they're still doing that. The fact he's a senior, yes, they will. Next year, they will be doing it. And how, um, because a FAFSA needs to be submitted for both students in college, it will necessarily take into account the two in college from a single household. Right. If that's really, it's getting behind the question there. All right, if we didn't answer that, um, Mr. and Ms. Hawkins, just re send an updated version of the question. All right, we have another question here about will financial aid packages be sent out early? if we've already filled out and submitted um, the application for early admission. And the answer is that if you have applied and been admitted to early action one, and you submit your FAFSA by December 15th and have that sent to Whitworth, you will be among the first batches of financial aid offers that we begin sending out in late January. Um, we wait on sending out offers to admitted students who haven't filed the FAFSA because it may just be that you haven't done it yet. And we wanna make sure if you are gonna file the FAFSA that we have that information and can include all the possible aid you're eligible for. So that's why we hold off on sending offers to admitted students who haven't filed the FAFSA until we at least get through all those who have filed the FAFSA. Uh, how do you, uh, what are the requirements for talent scholarships? Do you want to take that one, Tracy? Or do you want sure. To so for Whitworth, um, you'd want to consult with the department that you're pursuing the talent. So we have them through our arts and our music and theater and forensics and journalism. And we have some Young Life participatory scholarships. So you'd contact the respective department on campus and also review the website. Uh, usually there's an online application that required, and then depending if you're going to do some audition or submit some artwork, um, and then those are usually awarded in February um, from by the departments, um, and we try, we try to include them in your financial aid offer, but if the timing is such, we'll follow up with a revised offer to, to include them um, in, your, in your financial aid offer. Okay. I think we have caught up on all the questions. So I'm going to um, just kind of wrap up with some Whitworth specific information here or some additional information. The first being uh, the many different types of financial aid um, that Whitworth offers um, to students. The first and most significant is the university scholarship. Um, that is automatically awarded to all admitted students. We use information that we collect on the admissions application, so there's not a separate application for that. Uh, the scholarships range from 16,000 a year to 30,000 per year, renewable automatically for up to four years. And we notify students um, what their specific university scholarship amount is within two weeks of them um, being admitted. So um, once you're admitted, you'll get an electronic notification where you can go see, get the, get the happy news um, electronically. Then you receive an admit packet in the mail. And then usually one week after that, you'll receive a scholarship packet that will include um, your specific university scholarship amount. Every student who lives on campus automatically qualifies for a $4,000 housing grant toward tuition. And that um, grant also is renewable as long as students live on campus. Students who participate in one of our full day or overnight visit events um, automatically receive a $1,000 scholarship. 
that really isn't renewable because it's my way of simply bribing students to make a campus visit and help them make a well-informed decision. Um, and we've gone a step further this year and automatically um, promising to reimburse travel expenses for students in order to complete one of our full day or overnight visit events. And students should have received lots of information about that. It's also available on our campus visit website. Uh, we talked about the talent participation scholarships. Tracy just covered those. They range from $1,000 up to um, quite a bit more than that. Um, and as long as students are meeting the requirements, which are spelled out when the scholarship is awarded, usually they involve participating fully in whatever the program is, be it music, theater, forensics, those can be renewed um, all four years. Um, students who are, live in Washington State um, and have signed up for the college bound program offered through the state means they're eligible for a grant up to the amount of tuition plus a little bit at the University of Washington. And that same amount can be used at Whitworth and other private schools. And again, we go a step further that students who have a 3.0 GPA or higher and qualify for college bound, uh, we promise, that's what the Whitworth Bound promise is, to, uh, that 100% of their tuition would be covered between Whitworth resources, state resources, and federal resources. So that is a very great generous program. We have two, um, well, three really, uh, honor scholarship weekends coming up in February and March. Two will be in person and one will be virtual that is specifically for international students and students from the East Coast very far away. And at each of those events, which we typically have 100 to 120 participants, we award three full tuition scholarships renewable all four years and $10,000 uh, semifinalist scholarships that also renew all four years. And those semifinalist scholarships will stack on top of other aid you have received. And then you can see several other um, examples of types of aid that Whitworth offers to students based on different criteria. If you have any questions, Whitworth at edu slash scholarships will um, give you more details about eligibility for these scholarships. Right. Um, I want to yeah. Uh, we do have a question in the chat about do the visit days have to be specific visit days to receive the scholarship? Uh, well, they have to be one of our full day or overnight visit events, which include our Y Whitworth visit days, which happen almost every week throughout the school year. We did a fall preview event earlier this fall that was a full day uh, and option for overnight. We have these honor scholarship weekends I just talked about, which are qualifying. We have an, a mentoring visit program that specifically um, serves uh, underrepresented first-generation college students that qualifies. Uh, Bucks Bound, our big admitted student event, that's usually the biggest admitted student, biggest visit event of the year in the spring, qualifies. And then we have a pirate preview event late in the spring usually in early May, that's specifically for juniors. And that would be the earliest qualifying event that a student could, could um, get. And all of this is spelled out on the visit um, page. We're worth that edu slash visit. Anything else? Nope, that's great. Okay. Thank you. So I just wanted to highlight, uh, Whitworth is uh, one of the top programs, that, top universities in the country for um, military friendly, Ness, and it's for a lot of reasons that go into that classification. And we um, serve a lot of students who are either veterans or um, dependents of veterans or you know, children or spouses of currently serving active duty service members, people in the guard or the reserves. So if any of those apply to you, um, I encourage you to um, go to our veterans page on our website and you can read more about resources of support available to students, which include these ones listed here. And I'm really excited about a new 3000 square foot um, center, Military and Veterans Resource Center or Maverick as we call it, that we opened just last year that provides all kinds of um, resources, support services. And it's kind of a one-stop shop for um, 
learning about and accessing benefits that you need and other paperwork you need to process in order to utilize uh, military and veterans benefits. So uh, if you have any questions about that, don't hesitate to reach out to your admissions counselor or to our specific veterans um, outreach recruiting coordinator, Phil Labrie, and you can find his information online. So, so a lot of questions, good questions we hear about, okay, great, we've got a, a financial aid offer for our first year, but what about next year and the year after that? And I am proud to say, and this is really part of Tracy's um, integrity and ethics, that we don't do what's called front loading. So there are schools that offer very generous packages for first year freshman students. And then some of that aid or sometimes a lot of that aid kind of goes away for subsequent years. And we want students to, and families to be able to plan over four years and kind of have a predictable um, sense of what uh, their financial aid will be from year to year. We do offer um, 300 donor, we have 300 donor funded scholarships and we keep adding those every year. Many of them are um, targeted for returning students. So they are additional aid that students might become eligible for in their sophomore, junior and senior years. But we have dozens that are, are specifically targeted for incoming students. And um, later in the spring, we'll, we'll share information about um, how to apply for those. Talk about the talent participation scholarships. And then um, we have uh, what are called departmental scholarships. And so in every one of our um, academic departments from art to theater and theology, um, there are at least three, but up to 21 departmental scholarships and the number of scholarships available depend on the size of the department. So the departments that have more students, more majors, have more scholarships to award and they're uh, chosen by the faculty um, scholarships for the best sophomore, best junior, best senior students in, in, the, in the department. And then of course, many students apply for outside scholarships, which is a really great um, way to increase that gift aid, the best type of uh, financial aid that um, you will want. So how do you go about, what are some tips and tricks for um, qualifying or getting outside scholarships? One is starting early and it's, we're already kind of to the end of what I would say, the early season. Uh, you wanna get on this sooner rather than later. Some scholarships deadlines are like the end of the calendar year or early in, in the new year. So I would research now what the deadlines are so you're making sure you're prioritizing scholarships as the deadlines hit you. Try to collect information that many of these uh, scholarship application processes require like transcripts, essays, letters of recommendation that you can collect from, from teachers, mentors, pastors, and others. Your local high school counselor, your high school counselor, your high school is a great resource. Um, they will know particularly local scholarships that are available. And this is a tip I learned from Tracy. Definitely talk to the counselor at your high school, but uh, do a call, call other high schools in your area because there may be, you know, counselors at other high schools that have information about scholarships that your counselor doesn't have. We do encourage students to focus on local scholarships versus the national ones, because obviously the pool you're competing against will be much smaller for local scholarships. And there are, I promise you, wherever you live, I can't promise because in most places where you, you, most of you live, there are Rotary Clubs, Lions Clubs, Kiwanis Clubs. Uh, I'm blanking on more of those social service uh, clubs, many of which have long-standing established scholarship funds specifically for local students that you can take to any college. And because the membership, the active membership in many of those clubs is older, they're out of sight, out of mind for many of our younger families and students in the current generation. So I would, I would hit Google as soon as we get off this call to find those, those local um, service organization type clubs and see if any of them have scholarships. Your church might have a scholarship program. Your parents' employers might have scholarship programs. And just think about other, other groups and organizations that your family is a part of because you'd be surprised how many of them may have scholarship uh, programs specifically for active members. Um, you should never pay for scholarship. Uh, if, a, if an organization is asking you to pay to apply or to pay to be considered for a scholarship, 
it not only um, is suspect, but it could be kind of a phishing um, exercise. So I would I would avoid anything that expects you to pay. Um, Greg, yeah, we have an, a question in the chat about do outside scholarships impact future financial aid from Whitworth, which is a really good question. Outside scholarships do have to be reported and will be reflected in your financial aid offer. Very rarely does it impact your financial aid. And we always allow the student to determine whether the student wants to reduce loan or work. If it does have some impact, we always to add, you know, deal with self-help first. That may not be true at every school, so you want to consult them. Um, but I just wanted to clarify that. And then um, the question too is how is it determined who gets the honors scholarship? Yeah, that will be explained. So you have to be admitted with honors to be eligible and invited. And in the invitation, we will explain um, the criteria, but there are, I think this year we're gonna have four different activities that students participate in during the visit weekend. And those activities are evaluated and the students who have the best overall scores across the four activities are the ones selected for the scholarships. All right, um, quick next steps, um, deadlines. So if you haven't already applied um, for admission, I would encourage you to apply for admission. Whitworth doesn't have a fee. I don't understand why a college would, would charge you to apply for admission. We accept the common application. We have our own online application. There's no preference or fee for either one of those. And the only other thing we need is a high school transcript. And at this stage, we would even we'll even accept an unofficial transcript. We will ultimately need an official final transcript in order to actually award you financial aid. But at this point, an unofficial transcript will work. Um, our next early action deadline is January 15th. Um, but there we do rolling admissions. So we will review your application and give you an admissions decision um, whenever your application is complete. So there's no reason to wait till January 15th. We added that early action due deadline of January 15th just to kind of provide an incentive for more students to apply by January so that if they're admitted, we can also give them a financial aid offer earlier. Um, December 15th, like we mentioned earlier, is the priority deadline for students to submit their FAFSA or their WASFA to us so that they can be included in the first batch or round of financial aid offers that we'll begin sending out. We say February 1 here, but we really will expect to start sending those offers out even in late January. All right, <clears throat> next steps to think about. We will continue to offer um, webinars about financial aid and other aspects of the admissions experience and Whitworth life. If you haven't already done it, please, please file the FAFSA or the WASFA for international students, the CSS profile. And um, if you have been admitted and filed the FAFSA to us, you can expect to receive your financial aid offer um, in late January, early February. And shortly after that goes out to you, you'll be invited to schedule a financial aid Zoom call with your admissions counselor. I cannot underscore enough how helpful and valuable families have told us that those Zoom calls are because we'll walk through your offer, make sure you understand all the different uh, components of that offer, the types of aid you've, been re you've received, and then we'll help you sort of calculate what your balance left after financial aid would be to uh, attend Whitworth in the fall and what some of the most common resources or strategies families have used to cover um, that gap or the balance that will be due. And we also are able to explore and tease out whether there might be special circumstances um, that would enable us to review your financial aid offer and possibly consider you for additional resources. So there's just lots of really useful conversation that happens on those Zoom calls. Sometimes in order to consider you for a financial aid, um, um, for a special circumstance review and additional financial aid, we need to request some additional documentation. So that will let you know what that, those documents are and you need to get those back to us for us to be able to calculate and award any additional aid for special circumstances. Keep applying for additional scholarships, but honestly those deadlines are gonna be coming fast and you don't wanna sort of start that process after, you, after you've missed too many of those deadlines. So start soon on that and then submit your enrollment deposit 
as soon as possible, but no later than May 1st. And the easiest way to do that again is through your app status page. There's a link on there that says reply to offer of admission. And one of those options when you click on that is to submit your enrollment deposit now. You can also get to it by Whitworth, by going to whitworth.edu slash deposit. Okay, have any more questions come in, Tracy? Um, there have been a couple, but I have been responding to them. Okay, well, we are right at time. So good job, Tracy, especially. Uh, you did most of the um, presentation. And thank you all for taking the time to join us tonight. I hope this information was useful. If we didn't answer your question, please do not hesitate to reach out to us, either the admissions office or the financial aid office. You see the contact information on the screen right now and it's on the website. So thank you, good evening and happy holidays, Merry Christmas.